are we ready? Okay, so this part is in English again. So that we can share it with the rest of the world. This is the second video of the interactive media product lecture on the human factors, the human touch. Um, and you all have lots of ideas now. And the question now is what to do with it in terms of communication for yourself and for your client. And what I asked you in the deliverables, what I will ask you in the deliverables, is to make a concept scenario. And I don't know if the book talks about concept scenario in this particular way, because the book talks a lot about scenarios. And you can make scenarios. A scenario is like a story, right? It's a kind of story. It has a beginning, a middle, an ending, and it has a sort of timeline. Things happen, things happen one after another. That's a scenario. And there are lots of different kinds of scenarios. But for me, a concept scenario is a general image, a flow of events that communicates the, the core idea of your concept. So it's not complete. And it's not detailed. And you do not have all the interaction elements, all the little widgets and, and knobs and turning wheels that your product will eventually have. You don't have that yet. But you might create actual prototype elements in your concept scenario already because you need them to tell the story. Right? If you make a concept scenario of somebody that has a mobile device, then you ha and you want to draw a picture of it, then you have to, the, the, then the person has to have something in his hand, right? But the particular form that the mobile device will have in the end might might be completely different. So everything you write down or draw or photograph for a concept scenario is still negotiable, still in discussion, right? Every concrete form you use in this scenario is only there because you, you cannot tell stories with air, right? So you need concrete objects to tell your story. Is that a little bit clear? Whereas an interaction scenario of the concrete interactions that you can do and how to do them, they will tell you exactly how you designed the interface and how every interaction element, every interface element looks like and how it works. That will come later, maybe in the second or third iteration, you will be become very explicit about, well, in order to open a file, you make a sweep from left to right on the multi-touch table. But that's for later. So in the examples that I show, I want to show these examples as examples of concept scenarios. Now, it's a story, and a story can you can tell a story in images, and you can tell a story in text. And right now, you have some words on post-it notes, and you have a little bit of picture of an object or a, a person and an object on a on a one paper, and you need to, to transform that into a full story that gives more detail and in which you will incorporate, put in uh, stuff from your packed analysis. So in this scenario, you, would, you will give a little bit more detail about the people that use your product, the activity in which your product plays a part, plays a role, right? So the general activities that take place and the particular activities that people do with your product, the context and the existing technologies around it, and so on. I will give you uh, some examples. And they will all be visual, because you can tell a story. I, I could show you the, a text, right? That would be possible. It's, oh, this is not visible at all. Um, let me see. Well, if we close these things, then you can't see me anymore. I, I didn't like that. Oh. But leave the other ones open, because otherwise I, I will just try to change that. Because you know, I have a video of last week, and the second part, it's like a black <laughs> video. Let's see if I change this a little bit. Oh, you can't see it, right? Well, anyway, I'll just show you the next one. But 
This one is a circle of events, and it's very schematic. So it's not really a story, it's more one image of how one thing leads to another. It's very abstract. And that's the most abstract form of a concept scenario that you can make. This one is a little bit more concrete. This one you can see, right? It's a comic story. And in this comic story, several things happen. And so this is not the complete design of the product, right? Because lots of more things can happen than just this. But this little story will tell you the general idea of the product. So this product is um, to be used in brainstorm sessions because I do research in how to design interactive products for brainstorm sessions, right? So lots of my examples come from that area. And we designed, a, 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 this was an idea that we created and I haven't put all the text in the balloons yet. So uh, um, suppose you're sitting in a sub-session, sub-group session and you're discussing ideas, just like you, you guys just did. Um, then at the end of the session, each one will grab one of the pictures that he liked most and he will grab a small device that is hanging from a wire from the ceiling and he will point it at the device and make a picture of the idea that he likes. So you take one idea and you make a picture of it. And while you make the picture, you tell what you like about the idea. And that combination, audio and video, is then taken to a central room. And in the central room, on a big interactive screen, all the ideas are displayed, all the pictures that were taken are displayed, with a little, with a little avatar picture of all the participants. So you will immediately know this is an idea that has been photographed by John and if you pr press the interactive screen you will hear what John has to say about this idea. That happens here. Right? And then you can cluster ideas and then it will become one cluster of ideas with all the little avatars belonging to it and the idea behind it is that people will, will become committed to that idea. Because in brainstorm sessions, a lot of, lots of the time, lots of people are not really uh, committed to the process. And the facilitator tries to get everybody on board. So this part of the interface is intended to help with that. And then in the last part, the summary, the conclusion that has been made in the, in the next session can, is again open for photographing and telling a story about it. So it becomes an endless cycle. Well, that is just the idea, but here you see a way of visualizing it in a comic cartoon. And of course you need to think really good about the text that you add, because this text is the way to communicate your idea. Now, if you think, oh I'm not really good in drawing, then what you could also do, and let me see where the, where's the preview here is make very quick mock-up because you're making a, a prototype anyway and then create your concept scenario with sort of a acting out uh, pictures and then make your comic strip using those pictures these are just the pictures but I would put them in a, in a nice format with the right text and, and uh, explanation right oh again very dark now we still have to okay that's that doesn't really help, and maybe this one. <laughs> So here is uh, Veron, and he's sitting uh, at a multi-touch table, and he's uh, taking a, uh, an object here, and it's a book, and then he can put, can put it there, and then uh, from the object come all kinds of uh, symbols appear that you can then select, and uh, you can uh, put these symbols on your uh, book, and then you can write a story, and then you can... Um, change 
the letters if you don't like them and throw them away and then it says poof because it's been thrown away and you can take another object which is a book you can open it and then uh, words pop out from the book well and so on and so forth actually this scenario was more much more detailed than your concept scenario this scenario was made already far more into the project and it was much more detailed about how all the interactions evolve, right? If I would have made a concept scenario, I would have made a selection of one or three of key interactions from this set to tell the story, the general story. But you can see how easy it is to make such a thing like this, right? Just taking the pictures. Okay, so that's something I would like to ask you to do. Now I want myself on the video again to uh, make a little, little bit more light here. Any questions about that? No? Okay. And of course the, the, the idea of that is to communicate it with your client, who will get a very clear idea how you guys have interpreted the assignment and what what ideas you have come up with much more than if you just give a list and only text and it's also to communicate the idea with yourselves and to have a good starting point for the next iteration okay so design principles I won't be able to do them all and most of these you already have seen in your second year course but it might be that some of you have forgotten a little bit about the details so I think it's good to rehearse it a little bit and do it once more and what I would like to ask you is to compare it with the book because most of the stuff I say here literally comes back in the book but it's part of a bigger set because this guy, Don Norman, has been like the, the guru for basic usability principles uh, already from the 80s. The book has been written in the 80s. And it looks like it's a very old book, right? From the 80s, that's a long time ago. But if you start to think about it, some of these principles actually trace back to discussions that the old Greek people like 600 years before Christ, already were having. And these are discussions about how do we, how do human beings perceive the environment? How do we know what's there? And how do we know how to act? How can we learn about the world and, and decide what to do in the world? These are very fundamental philosophical questions. And it's very basic psychology in there. So in that sense, these rules about how that works with people. That's a discussion that has been going on for 2,000 years and, and it, it will continue to be relevant for the next 2,000 years, I think. So in that sense, a book from the 1980s is very young. Right? And it doesn't really matter whether it's from the 80s or from the 40s or from the 20s. They all discuss the same basic questions. But the examples in the book are very old. And so if you read the book, you think, oh, this guy, he's talking about uh, matrix printers or whatever, and uh, what's this? But you have to sort of read through that. And that's why I didn't give you the book on your list, but just gave the, the new book, and then the new book copied the principles and, and uh, had a thought of new examples to go with. I'll give you some examples as well. Okay, one of the most important things, this picture is also in the book, uh, that Don Norman talks about is that there is a sort of a gap between on the one hand what people think and what they want and the goals that they have and on the other hand um, what their access to the world in which they have to actually reach their goals right so this is just this is in your mind 
this, these are your dreams and ideals and, and desires. And this is the real physical world of practice. And there's a gap between them. And there's two gaps, actually, or two, um, you can make two bridges to bridge the gap. One is, if I want something, I need to know what to do in order to reach my goal. That's the bridge of ex execution. And the other one is, when I did something, I need to know what the effect of was in the world. So to, in order to know um, whether I was right, whether I succeeded. So the goal of execution, the gap, needs to be bridged. And one of the things with which you can bridge this gap is with making things visible in your system. So one question of visibility is, can I see in what state the system is in? And can I see what I can do with the system? And the next step is, given that I want something, and given that I can see what I can do, can I also directly see what I have to do in order to get what I want? And I will give you examples. The other one is the goal of evaluation. Does the system show the effects of your action? And does it show what new state it's currently in? So when I push a button, I want to see what the effect of that is. And what the system is in now. And can I then, if I see what the system did, does that give me information in determining whether I succeeded, whether I've reached my goal. Suppose I want to copy a file. Can I then see if I succeeded? Do I have proof that the file is actually copied? And that I can throw away the other one? That, those are kinds of things you want to know, right? Now, for instance, this is a, a water tap. I, I showed you the left one um, when you were in second grade. And, well, I don't know if you can see it very clearly. I, I, my slides are not very visible, so uh, not very usable for you. But what would be the way to operate this tab? Does anybody have an intuitive idea? Break it. Hmm? Break it. Break it. <laughs> well, no, that's not necessary, but... Uh, It's a tab here, huh? I can't see what it is. Oh, you can't see it. How can I change this? Okay, I will just... Uh... Is this help? Can you see it? No? Okay, so the quiz, que the pop quiz question for you guys at home is how to operate this tab. Actually, uh, how to operate it is to hold your hands below it because it's got a sensor. But on top of it, there's a knob, which looks very much like uh, that you have to press a knob or something. And then just the other day, I found the, this one. It's a small movie clip. So this is a water tap. And I did something. right? And now the question is, do we have information about the state that the system is now in? Shall I show it again? What is, what is the information given to you and what is your conclusion? No. I saw the open can. Yeah. And it comes the water Yeah, no, no water is running. So, potential conclusion? Doesn't work. It's broken, doesn't work. Of course, it does work, but it works differently. Ah, this is how it works. So you you can turn it, but then nothing happens, and you have to but you have to push it aside. And then water comes out. So what you actually have to do is this: the official way to operate it. <laughs> so this is an example of a water tap that really communicates very ambiguous signals to the user about 
what you can do, what you should do, and what the effect of your actions are, and what state the system is in, right? And so the, the gap between what the user wants, water, and the physical system, and, what, and how that works, the gap is very big. And if you design the interface in a better way, you can bridge the gap and make it smaller, so that it's easier to cross this bridge. And that's one thing that Donald Norman would want you guys to do. People will invent lots of other ways to create the kind of feedback that they need. So this is an example of an overhead projector that is in a far away corner of a big auditory lecture hall and teachers have lots of problems uh, determining when they push the remote control they would want to have feedback about whether the overhead projector actually received the signal from the remote and went on but it takes a while for the, the, the lamp to heat up right? so the only thing you could use to know whether the thing is on or not is to check whether the fan starts blowing and so what they did is they put an uh, orange uh, strip of paper in front of the fan and so when you put it on the fan becomes, uh, starts blowing and you see the orange uh, strip of paper wiggling in the air and then you know, okay, my action actually had an effect on the machine So that's about visibility and feedback, right? And bridging the goals. Next principle. This is a very difficult one. And then again, it's also very natural to us. Because it's a property of how we perceive the world, how human beings perceive the world. But in terms of explaining it and understanding it, it's a complex concept. It's the concept of affordance and affordance is a, is a word, that, uh, a concept that comes from um, perception theory in psychology and especially from the theories of uh, James Gibson who was an ecological uh, perception psychologist and ecological psychology means ecologis, ecological means that you really look into the real, actual world, how things work and not only in the laboratory. So you start with the physical world of rocks and light reflecting on, on water, uh, surfaces, uh, objects that are hidden behind each other and so on. And how people use all those cues to uh, navigate in the world. And actually all of those theories directly apply to all the other animals as well. It's a very biological theory about how animals create and perceive the world around them. Well, what's an affordance? An affordance is the natural and un sort of unconscious seduction that an object has and the way an object sort of directly draws you into certain behavior. And the short typical example is the chair. If I have a chair, then just looking at the chair will directly uh, afford, it will directly seduce you into sitting. You can actually measure brain signals. If people watch a chair, then in the motor system, those neurons, those neural systems, that are associated with sitting and using your legs are activated. So looking at the chair is in a way starting to sit on it already. But then of course we are human beings so we don't do everything we, that comes to mind. We can then decide not to sit. But recognizing the chair is in a way very entangled with sitting. Or depending on your goal, if you want to manually check whether the overhead projector is running or not and the chair is standing like this, it will immediately afford standing on it and, and reaching the seat. Right? 
So it very much depends, the, the particular affordance that an object has very much depends on context as well. If my current need is to, to get access to the ceiling, because I want to press that, that red button that's there, I don't know what it's doing, the red light, and I want to press it, then immediately I start looking around if objects will give me, and then this chair is immediately the most likely candidate for helping me in achieving my goal. It also depends, the affordance of this chair, to my bodily possibilities for action. I'm of a certain height, I have certain clothes on, if I, if I have, if I, uh, have a, a mini skirt like this, then uh, standing on the chair in this cultural situation might not be the right thing to do, and that immediately I, I, I carry around my own sort of body image with me, so when I look at the chair, the chair means something for me and my body and my possibilities for action at this moment, right? So it's very relative. For, a, for an animal, this might be a shelter, right? You sit under it. Okay, so in Donald Norman, has been made, uh, sort of, it has become famous for the so-called Norman door, which is a door that you need to pull but it actually looks like a door that you can push. And you all have had, had experiences with those kinds of doors, right? The other way around can be as well, but it's not so likely. A door that you need to push, but it looks like a pull door. And you have, and he has examples of doors that you, that you think you uh, need to turn the handle and then pull, but actually it, you can turn it and it's a slide door. I mean, everything is possible. People make all kinds of stuff. But if you make it to have the affordance of a push door, then of course it should be a push door. And otherwise you should design it differently. So the design challenge here is to design the right affordance, the one that matches the mechanical operation of the machine. Now people are very clever. Oh, this is also bad. I'm, I'm, I don't know how, how, how I'm going to do it with these pictures. Uh, you can't see it, but this is a, um, a building across the street. And you have these balconies. And they, once every two months there is a, w a window cleaner. And this window cleaner obviously has a task to do his job as fast as possible. Or he, get, he, get, he gets paid by the hour probably. So he thinks if I do it very quickly then I have the, the rest of the afternoon off. So what he does is just, he stands on this balcony, he is here, you can see it in the, at home, in the slides. He stands on the balcony with no uh, security measures whatsoever, and he just walks like that over the balcony and then does the entire window. So this balcony, for him, has this particular affordance for action, standing on it, given his t task and given the context of wanting to do his job as fast as possible. But of course it's very dangerous. And the designer of this balcony obviously never intended for people to stand on it like that. And this is of course very relevant uh, when you design things for children. right? Because children will do kinds of stuff that you think are dangerous. And if the affordance is very strongly to do it like that, then you can't blame the children. Right? Also, making a big field of, night of grass along in a park and then putting a small sign on it don't walk on the grass it's, it's violating everything that is natural and human to us in terms of affordance right? and it won't work people will walk on the lawn this is a creative use of affordances of uh, something designerly that was not designed for anything I think Maybe it was designed to avoid people going between that small uh, space. Somebody needed to uh, grab his mobile phone and put the stuff on there. Actually, it was me. And actually, I also a little bit designed it to make the picture. But <laughs> Shouldn't have said that. And you have a, a, a website called Thoughtless Acts. Uh, and uh, it has a Flickr uh, site associated with it. 
and then you can there you can upload all kinds of everyday examples of how people use the affordances of the environment. So that's a small hole in a very old table, and uh, somebody put his umbrella in it. And this is sort of a, uh, a gap in an old stone building that uh, uh, the cleaner uses to uh, dry his mop. Is mop an English word? In Dutch, it's mop. This is creative use of an uh, iMac from MacBook during lunch break. So that's affordances, right? And you have to think about the affordances that your product has. And if you design tables, some of your groups do tables, then maybe the best thing to do is not to start with the digital interface part, but first to think of the affordances of tables, normal tables. And if you design for something on a wall or a floor, maybe the first thing to do in discussing this is to think about the normal, everyday um, affordances that a wall or a floor might have for people. And then try to think how your interactive concept fits in there. Right? How are we doing in time? It's time, right? 11.40 was already time. So, uh, what we will do is we will just continue next week with this part. And if there is any question now, then I would like to hear it. No? Okay, then I thank you and we will continue next week. And good luck with the last part of your product design for this situation.